Okay. So, as I said, uh, the last two lectures today and the, uh, the last one uh, will be uh, on not on deep learning, but on understanding object uh, or in general neural representations of uh, uh, in, in 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 deep learning. And uh, what I what I mean by that is uh, uh, taking uh, a trained or pre-trained networks, as you will see, and understand what type of representations emerge uh, 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 due to learning uh, of a task. And so this is the title, Emergence of Object Representations in Neural and Artificial Perceptual Hierarchies. I'll give a, uh, today I'll give an introduction, uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll switch to the uh, blackboard to, uh, uh, to do some, uh, some theory about uh, definition of manifolds and separability and relation to geometry. And the next lecture will be showing you uh, uh, numerical experiments uh, and then discussing uh, uh, rapid learning uh, of, uh, of new objects. OK, so, uh, so this work, um, uh, I've worked on it for, for several years. And I, uh, by now, I'm fortunate to have uh, very, uh, uh, very brilliant uh, Colleagues, Dan Lee, uh, Su Yun uh, is now uh, uh, is now in uh, uh, NYU and uh, uh, and Flatiron. Uh, ben is here, and Uri is uh, finishing his PhD at Hebrew University. Um, okay, so so uh, I want to give you some historical context from neuroscience because this is what actually motivated me to think about the problem. So for, uh, uh, let's discuss the visual system. You all know this is the eye. The, out the, the output of the, uh, of, the, of the eye is the retina. Then there are processes, uh, uh, the, the, the optic fiber that takes the signals from the eye, from the retina, uh, to, to the to cortex. And, and the first station is V1, or primary visual cortex, at the back of, uh, of our head. Uh, and, uh, and then from there it goes uh, to, to many other stations and, and, and process. And how, how do we think about what the brain does with the, with the uh, photons that impinge on, on the eye? And uh, it, uh, the, 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 the central concept used to be a receptive field, so already discovered in the, uh, by Heartline. Uh, if you look at the, uh, at the photoreceptors, uh, uh, you, you see... Um, that, that, that a given neuron uh, is uh, responsive to uh, a spot of light in, the in, 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 in a patch of the visual field, in, in a localized patch. It has a circular, uh, a circular uh, geometry, a circular receptive field. So if the line is, uh, uh, if there is a spot of light here, the cell will, will fire. If, if here it will be suppressed. Uh, other cells will be uh, will off cells, so then they will be excited by light in their surround and suppressed by central. Other neurons will have, of course, different receptive field uh, locations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is true to for the photoreceptors for the first uh, photoreceptors for the first array uh, uh, in, in, of the retina, and but it's also true for the for the output of the retina although there are some differences in the receptive field. But basically, uh, the output of the retina sends signals about spots of light in, in a localized circular point in the visual field. Uh, but then uh, what happens in, when, when the signal goes to, context, uh, to cortex, primary visual cortex, and it was discovered by Jubel and Wiesel uh, about 20 years later, that uh, cells are selective that don't like really spot of light. Uh, uh, they, they like they like oriented edges like bars or gratings, uh, drifting in their visual f in receptive field and so on. So there is still a receptive. So if you map uh, the selectivity of neuron, you still uh, see that it responds to a localized region in the visual field. So it has this localized receptive field, but it has an elongated uh, and an elongated uh, 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 geometric structure where. For instance, here, spots of light along this axis will excite the cell, and spots of light around uh, in the surround uh, will inhibit the cell. So then you can say, OK, so what the cell does, it's selective. It's it, it responsive to, a, to a, a bar in this direction, 
and it will be suppressed by a bar orthogonal or not responsive to it. So then from that you can, uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can describe the, of the performance of, the, the, sorry, the selectivity of the neuron as the neuron is selective to orientation. Uh, so uh, you plot here orientation tuning curve, this is the firing rate of the neuron, the response amplitude of a single neuron, and this is the angle uh, of, the, uh, of the oriented, uh, the, the angle of the bar or the grading here. And in this particular case, you can say, well, the neuron has a preferred angle. So this is the feature that the neuron uh, likes, this particular neuron, and it responds only the, to uh, a narrow band of angles around the, its preferred angle. Another neuron will have here, another one will have here, and so on and so forth. So you can say that primary visual cortex is a collection of neurons, and they are, again, filters of the visual uh, signals, but now they filter not spots of light, like here. They filter the, 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 the feature that they like uh, are, uh, are orientations. Uh, and, and so that's, that's nice, very nice, and uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, but then you ask, okay, what happens? Uh, what happens to the next stages? So, uh, okay, before we go to the next stages, and then, you know, I, I don't want to go into a uh, historical perspective on the theory of early vision. If we want to ask, okay, can we understand, let me go back to this, do we understand why, what are the sizes of these uh, receptive fields and uh, the retina, and they, they seem to be, they, they are known to be adaptive, and, and why you get this Gabor, filters, uh, as, as we, we call them in the primary visual cortex, and uh, there will be beautiful theories which were developed were called efficient coding theories and information theory that really predicted or at least accounted uh, for, for this, uh, you know, the first stage uh, are, are circular filters, and then the next stage uh, are, are predicted to be uh, Gabor filters, these kind of uh, simulations of these theories, and so on and so forth. Then, of course, people, um, many, many of us uh, ask, okay, what about the local cortical circuit? So there's a lot of work on that, but that's outside uh, the topic today. But then the question was, okay, what's going on beyond V1? Beyond, so here you have the, uh, the stream of uh, propagation of signals, visual signals, uh, from V1, which is here, to the rest of the brain. So this is all visual cortex, so they're all visual areas. Prim they, they don't respond, so primarily they don't respond to auditory or other signals. It's visual cortex, it's a big chunk of our, of our cortex, both in humans and in primates. Uh, so, uh, so then there's famous uh, two streams, one stream, a dorsal stream, which, which cares mostly about location and motion, uh, and, and uh, we are interested in the ventral stream, uh, where, uh, the, where neurons are mostly selective to, uh, to shapes and colors uh, and, and so on. So, so then the question is, what, what's, what's going on in this ventral visual system here? V1, V4, etc. MT, uh, no, MT is in dorsal, but then IT. So there are many stages here. Some of them you know, uh, written here. Uh, the, uh, the photoreceptor pixel layer, output re retinal ganglion cells at the output of the retina. So this is like the, the eye, then LGN, which is, we'll not talk about it, it doesn't change much. Then V1, V2, V4, you know, up to IT. So from the perspective of uh, experimental neuroscience, uh, there was some progress in understanding what happens in, uh, you know, maybe V2, V2 V4, end stoppers, uh, maybe cur cur curvature cells, trying to, uh, to uh, characterize the, 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 what type of filters or uh, features that are uh, being processed or selected for in those stages. And then we, one go to IT, and then what was discovered that IT uh, neurons, many of them like uh, respond to objects. Different objects, uh, different neurons respond maybe to different objects, different faces. So they, are they respond to much more complex, uh, complex set of features. Uh, but it was difficult to actually uh, make sense of it for two reasons. First of all, the complexity of the features. And secondly, it turned out that the, the deeper you go into the brain, 
the more the idea of a single neuron characterized by a fixed set of features that the neuron is selective for uh, turned out to be not so useful because it was very contextual. Uh, so you can say, well, for a given selection of object, the neuron likes uh, you know, this part or, or uh, but, but, uh, this type of features, but then you show another set of objects and they change. So, the, so a very strong nonlinear or contextual uh, influences on the receptive field properties of neurons. So this was be basically a dead end. Uh, so the field was really stuck. And there was no really uh, a, a theoretical framework for understanding that. So this is the kind of the heroic attempt. Simple cells, complex cells, end stopper, curvatures, and so on. But they all were of, of limited, limited use. All right. Uh, but in, in kind of a, an, an analogous uh, trajectory uh, happened to, uh, to machine vision. Or computer vision was again the similar story. Uh, this taken from Jan Lecun. Maybe he'll show it also today, tonight. Uh, you know, the, there was attempt to kind of uh, design local, low-level features like you know V1-like features, but then more mid-level features, high-level features, and then on top of this you do a classifier. But these features were basically um, were, were were just picked des by design. And this was, as you know, this wasn't really uh, extremely productive. OK. And then, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, the ImageNet competition, it's all known, the, the deep network success uh, in, uh, in, uh, in an object recognition task. And uh, as we say, the rest is history. Uh, but then, uh, and, uh, and uh, as you all know, that uh, deep convolution networks were, were turned out to be very very successful in this kind of object recognition task. Uh, this is the AlexNet, this is the VGG16, ResNet, etc., uh, etc. Et so all these are different architectures and different size uh, uh, of, uh, of deep convolutional networks, which, which, are, which uh, you know, as, as time progresses, they, they become better and better in doing this job. Uh, but again, you can ask sim similar questions. So what are single neuron here or single neuron here or a given layer? What are the features? What does the neuron respond to? But again, this, this is kind of question that classical computer vision would, would do. They will design neurons responding to this and that filters. Uh, and here the idea is, OK, I don't know. We just, we just train the networks, and, and that's what it is. So. Um, Okay, so so you can say that um, you know both both uh, both extremes are, are, are unsatisfactory. The the old way of uh, of uh, thinking about the the problem is trying to map painstakingly what a neuron respond to when you change the images and so on. Uh, is is turns out not to be useful. But just to say, well, I don't know what the neurons are doing in, in artificial neural networks or in the brain, but they, 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 they do the job. They, they do well in object recognition. So uh, uh, what I'm going to, uh, to uh, co try to convince you that there is some mid midway in between these extremes, uh, that, that, that there, there is a way, I, I think, to try to understand better what type of representations emerge in those networks. And, 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 and using those tools, conceptual tools and, and algorithmic tools, try to actually see if this works not only in artificial neural networks, but also in understanding IT cortex. Uh, and, and, and the way to, to do it is to not to ask questions, microscopic questions, uh, but to ask more macroscopic questions. In other words, to characterize some macroscopic or population or statistical population uh, properties of the uh, object representation. So that's uh, that's the motivation. Okay, and the the the, the basic idea, just the, the conceptual idea, comes from. Um, it actually uh, historically is an old uh, is an old approach to a new, to understanding what a neural network is doing at the population level is to ask, okay, if I want to understand what the neuron do, uh, how the neuron code some variable theta, well, I, I, I build a decoder and, and ask how the decoder performs. 
so, so this is the approach in, in, in a way uh, that uh, starts with the ideas of Jim DiCarlo and, and, and David Cox and, and others, is to, to say that what the, what the system is doing uh, is trying to untangle perceptual manifolds, object manifolds. But, but what does it mean, a manifold? A manifold means a collection. So this is a, a, a state, this is state space uh, of, uh, of a, a, a neurons in, in, uh, of the neural responses in any given layer, let's say in the retina, if the retina, if the, I don't know, the output of the retina, a million, million neurons, so this is a million out of the million. Each point here is a response of the million neurons to a given image, but the same, the same perceptual object, in this case the same face of Joe, can generate different images and therefore can generate different, different responses. So you have a manifold of neuronal uh, of vectors which correspond to the collection, to the set of uh, uh, responses of, uh, of this layer uh, to uh, all in physical instantiations of Joe. And then you have another manifold corresponding to Sam. Okay? Now, these manifolds are entangled into each other when you look at the pixel layer. And the idea is that the, the primary con computational goal of having this hierarchy is to untangle this. So the, the idea is, in, if you look at IT cortex, I, hypothetically, you should see that the same set of points corresponding to the manifold jaw now kind of lie in nice, uh, nice uh, uh, manifold and uh, corresponding for Sam likes here, and then it's kind of easily separated. So the idea is there is no magic going from here to here in the sense that we assume, and, and I'm going to assume, that those two manifolds are separated, but nonlinearly. But to separate them is hopeless uh, because of the highly nonlinear structure uh, of, of, this, uh, of these manifolds and how they are entangled. And the reformatting, so there is no in extra information here, simply reformatting these manifolds in a way that it will be easier to decode. So, so that's the idea of untangling of manifolds. And I'm going to build on this idea to understand uh, what does it mean to untangle, how much untangling you need, and, and so on and so forth. So the idea is, uh, so, so I, I, I'm introducing here colloquially the concept of manifolds. And again, a manifold in each one of these stages will be uh, the, the collection of, uh, of uh, population vectors uh, in, in, uh, in, in the corresponding state, state space, uh, which correspond to a given concept, a given object, a given face, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, if there are questions, please ask me now, because this, this is the conceptual basis that I'm going to develop. Okay, so, so here's the idea, okay, and, uh, and this, is, this is related to the question of invariances, and I want to I want to emphasize this because uh, uh, what, what, we, what we are doing here is dealing with, with a fundamental problem of sensory processing, which is how to deal with perceptual invariance. The perceptual invariance means that a given concept, like a, 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 a person or an, a given object, like a cat or, or a dog, comes in nature in, in many very different physical instantiations. So the, there is a whole space of uh, uh, the whole ensemble of uh, images uh, that uh, uh, signals, physical signals, that, that is, are mapped by, by the perceptual system eventually to a cat and to a dog or to Joe and Sam. And, and the problem is how the system gets rid of this invariance in the sense that the system uh, the, the perceptually can categorize all this variability uh, in, in, into these discrete categories. Uh, so, so uh, this is the question of perceptual invariance. Now, one would perhaps uh, like to think that if I look at IT cortex and I look at the response of the population of neurons in IT cortex to, to this manifold, they'll just be invariant. The, 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 a neuron will respond to a category. It turns, so this means that perceptual invariance is already achieved at the level of IT cortex. Okay. Correspondingly, you might imagine that if you look at the uh, at the deep convolutional networks, going back here, uh, no, no, I'm going up. Sorry. Uh, that if I look at the feature layer, and I'll call feature layer 
not the readout layer, but, but the layer uh, before that. Uh, so if you look at this layer, you can imagine, OK, so maybe what this magically had been done, had been doing is, re is representing I uh, inputs as, as, as invariant. So there is one vector of responses, one set of responses to all images corresponding to, to Joe or Sam. It turns out that this is not the case. So, so it's interesting. It, it very, follows very nicely what we see in IT cortex, that there is uh, selectivity to objects and to faces and so on and so forth, but it's not invariant. So the invariance eventually comes downstream. So the idea is that the visual hierarchy are preparing the job. Are, 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 uh, you know, if I go here, back here, the visual hierarchy is not invariant. It doesn't map all this to a point, but, but, but these uh, manifolds are now manageable by readout neurons that, for instance, do linear separation, OK? So that's, that's the idea. So and, and, and again, this idea you can take to, uh, to auditory cortex. You can take to other, uh, other sensory hierarchies. OK, so what, what, what eventually we'll be doing uh, after developing the theory is basically is, is trying to test it by saying, OK, so let me look how much I can. Suppose I have a readout neuron here and trying to read out, to separate those manifolds by hyperplane, how, how well it can do, hopefully poorly. And then look at if I do read out from here, or read out from here, read out from here, read out from here, how improved I, I, the performance is for a linear classifier, a linear decoder that is applied to each one of the stages as a measure of the untangling of those manifolds. OK? This is the general idea. OK. But before I do that, uh, I, I, want to, I want to introduce, uh, I, I want to do the theory. Uh, but before I do the theory, I want to, um, no, OK, good. OK, so, so, so I, I want to do the theory. Uh, and I'll switch to, to the blackboard. Uh, I just want to say, OK, so there are two questions. What ensemble of computations are good measure of untangled manifolds? And what are the relevant geometric measures? And there are a series of papers. Uh, the references that you can look. Okay, so uh, I can I can turn this off and turn this on. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm looking at uh, at a single a single layer, you have a population of neurons uh, that uh, respond to an image, to a stimulus. So, uh, you know, think about this as a kind of uh, n-dimensional uh, uh, space, so x1, x2, etc. This is xn. So each point here is the response of uh, all the neurons, right? It's a vector with n components. It is a response of each one of the neurons uh, to, to a given stimulus, an image of a cat. And then there will be another image of a cat. So there, there will be another vector, another point here. And there will be another image of a cat, will be point here, and, you know, and point here, and so on and so forth. So let's say these are responses corresponding to the cat. As we said, I'll call this a manifold one, a manifold of a cat. And, um, well, similarly, I may have uh, responses to, uh, so this is, this is a cat. And then I have, uh, I have a collection of images here. So this one will be uh, maybe an image of a dog, and Im another image of a dog, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and, and this will be another manifold, right? So, so this is the idea. Very simple. OK, so now we want to formalize it. So I, I'm calling a manifold any uh, compact set in Rn. In other words, this is Rn. I'm talking about Rn. All, all the points are vectors in Rn. And I'm not, uh, unlike in mathematics or even statistics and machine learning sometimes, manifolds are defined by the smoothness property. But in, in my case, it's completely general, OK? 
Well, I, I, I'm making some assumptions, but not, not necessarily smooth, smooth assumptions. So what I mean by manifold is that, uh, um, so I'll famously denote manifold, different manifold by mu. So this may be mu equals to 1. This is mu equals to 2, et cetera. And I'll have p manifolds, of course. Okay. So p manifolds, p manifolds. And again, these are all collection of points in Rn. So n is the embedding, dimension of the embedding space. Okay? So each one of them is characterized by the following uh, way. So it's x mu. And again, it's a vector if you want, but uh, I'm lazy. Okay, there will be x0 mu. And then there will be uh, a subspace, d dimensional subspace of Si times Ui mu. So this is x mu of S, and I'll explain what, what I mean by that. So uh, each manifold, OK? So now forget about this picture. Maybe I'll do this picture here. So I'm formalizing the manifold, each manifold in the following way. So I have this, OK? So, uh, so, on. so this is Rn. Now, I'm looking at one manifold, maybe collection of points here. So I'm defining a center of the manifold. This is x0 mu. This is the center of mass of the manifold, the distance, the distance vector from the origin, how far the position of the manifold relative to an origin. And then within this, and then I'm assuming this is the d-dimensional subspace, so what's, what's known as a fine subspace, a fine subspace is the linear subspace that are displaced from the origin. So this is now, I have here, I have here, u1, in this case it will be two-dimensional subspace, u1, u2, but in general it will be d-dimension. Okay, so it is a d-dimensional subspace, and then the points, so you can project each, each point in this manifold, you can write as the center, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to assume for simplicity that the u's are orthogonal to the center. That's for simplicity. For now, in, in the theory, we, we do more general. So u1 and u2 are, are orthogonal, not like I, I drew it, sorry, are orthogonal to x0, right? So, so x0, you know, mu are orthogonal dot yi, the u are, are zero, or approximately zero. Uh, so, so the manifolds are kind of centered so that uh, the, the center of mass is, is basically the distance from the origin, uh, and, 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 uh, and the subspace spanning the manifold is orthogonal to x0. And they are also orthogonal, so u i mu dot u j mu are also zero, or at least approximately zero. So this is the, the, this is the subspace in which the, in which the manifold resides in. And then there are the shape. It's, it's, it, the manifold it doesn't spend the entire subspace. Right? Uh, it's it just constrained by some shape. So the shape variable is SI, is the coordinate of x mu on the subspace, so the SI. And SI obeys some SI, this vector, this so I, I'll denote by S the, 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 the vector of uh, B dimension, right? So this is this coefficient here. And they obey some, they obey some, I don't know, some, let's call it M, some constraint, okay? For instance, if the manifold, let's say an example, if it's ellipsoid, then, you know, sum over I, SI um, squared over RI squared, are one where R I are the radii of the of, of the, the of the of the uh, of the ellipse and, and S I square is the and S I are the uh, are the coordinates, right? I goes from one to D. If it is sphere, all the R I's are the same. If you want to do it if you if the manifold is a collection of points inside the the the, 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 the ellipsoid, then it will be here. If it is on the surface, it is equal to this, etc., etc. So this, this is clear. So 
these are the coordinates of the manifold, uh, the coordinate of the Rn points on the, uh, on the d-dimensional uh, manifold. There is a, all, all the points have, have projection one on the center. This is for simplicity, cent centered manifold. And have projection Si on the UI. So as you vary Si, subject to the constraint given here, you, you, are, you are basically mapping the manifold in n dimension. Okay, that's, that's so sometimes I'll denote uh, just, you know, capital S as, as 1 times little s. This will be kind of a d dimension, d plus 1 dimension characterization where 1 is the projection on the center and s is the projection on d dimension. But, but uh, I'll, I'll try to avoid it, but may, maybe I'll need it. Okay, anyway. The more general, if I don't assume orthogonality, the more general description will be d plus one dimension. But I, I like this orthogonality; it, it's kind of clarifying. Okay, so this is this is the, this is the definition of a manifold. And yes. It doesn't matter. Uh, so I, as I said, you can put here less or equal. Then it will be inside. You can put here equal, then it will be on the, on the surface. But, but you can also have manifold, which, uh, so manifold which, which are point cloud. That's a set of points, discrete set of points. Okay, so it's completely general. So when I talk about you know, point cloud, okay, it will just be each manifold will just be a set of points. M points, for instance, per manifold or something like that, finite. It's, it's completely general. Uh, okay, so uh, however, um, what else I want to, uh, to say about these manifolds? Um, is it centered? Okay, so I'm going to assume for simplicity, I'm going to assume now that there are P of them, and I'm going to assume that all of them have the same geometry. That, again, for simplicity, the theory is more general. So all, all the P manifolds will have the same, if, if one is ellipsoid, all of them are ellip uh, the same shape, okay? They differ by the position of the center and the orientation of the use, the subspace. So one manifold is here with this orientation, another manifold is here in that orientation, and so on and so forth, okay? I'll talk about the orientation position uh, in a moment, so, but, but the geometry will be the same just for simplicity. Uh, and, and also, uh, I would, uh, like to do, uh, sometimes I will scale, I'll introduce uh, uh, just theoretically uh, as a construct by, by saying uh, I, I put R here, little r here. So this will be then another parameter R, which I'm just doing for the mathematical clarity because then I can say, okay, what happens if I take the same shape of manifold, the same dimension, but I shrink it or expand it uniformly? So this is the scaling R. So it's, it's nice to clarify things, and, and you'll see how, how I use it. So this will be uh, R equals to 1 is the natural manifold. R less than 1, I shrink it. R bigger than 1, I expand it. OK, so, I ha so we have this manifold. I'll talk more about the collection of manifolds. And U goes from 1 to P, P manifolds. And now we want to do computation. So I'm talking about linear separability of these manifolds, okay? And uh, in principle, one could say, let's say, uh, like, like, in, like in object recognition task, let's ask, uh, can you linearly separate uh, this manifold from all the rest, or this manifold from all the rest? This is how, theoretically, and it is too fine-tuned in, in also in practice, and I would like to uh, introduce instead an ensemble of linear classification problem. So I, have, I can average over many, many different tasks. But all of them are linear classification. And the way I do it, so the task, the task is that I am generating labels, binary labels, y mu plus minus 1. OK? And then the task is to find uh, a linear classifier, so I can write it down as y mu to find w, n-dimensional weight vector, such that w dot 
x mu, of course, of all points on the manifold, uh, are, is, is bigger or equal to some, to some margin which is bigger than zero. So, you know, bigger than zero is linear separation. In general, I can ask, okay, I want to separate it with a margin cup. Okay. Um, so, okay, so, so this is the task. And now, and now I can generate many, many different labels. And I have many, many different linear classification tasks. And I can kind of average over them and say, are, they, are the manifold are nicely separated so that I can, with high probability, as we'll talk about in a minute, I can separate half of them from the other half. OK. Um, OK, so now we have to do some statistical assumption to do some, to do some work. So uh, here is the statistical assumptions. So in terms of the in terms of the geometry of the manifold, I'm going to assume that they are so they are randomly random positions and orientations. Right? So this means that you know the U I I'm sorry, this is delta I J of course. So the ui mu dot uj nu is, is delta mu nu, delta ij, uh, at, at least approximately, but, you know, OK. Yes? I we were trying to find the uh, representation of the x mu such that they were going to be separable. But now you're saying we're finding a given x mu, a w such that it separates the I'm, I'm trying, given manifolds, I'm trying to find weight, which is, you know, weight vector, which is defining a hyperplane, which will separate the plus manifold from the minus manifold. Okay? Then I have the same manifolds, I have different labels, so different collection of manifolds are plus and minus. Then, of course, I'll need another W, and so on and so forth. For each set of labels, I need to find weight vector that separates the pluses from the minus. And again, if I didn't say it, it's, I, I want to emphasize the, the, the labels uh, are uniform within manifold. All the points of the manifold has to have the same label, either plus one or minus one, depending on the y's. So y mu, it doesn't have s, right? Y mu is the same for all points s on the manifold. That, that's important, otherwise we didn't do anything. OK, so again, manifold the random positions in the same x0 mu dot x0 nu is, uh, again, approximately at least delta mu nu. OK, um, I have to say something about the normalization. So basically what I'm doing uh, is that uh, the u's and the x's are, are going to be uh, unit one vectors, but at least in statistics. So basically I'm, I'm taking all components uh, of, of, uh, of the vectors u and all components of the axis u, uh, all components of them. This is the n-dimension, it's all n-dimensional vectors. So all the components are Gaussians with variance 1 over n. So they're approximately unit vectors and they're approximately orthogonal to each other. Okay, that's what I'm going to, uh, to, to assume. So this is the statistics of the manifold. So the manifold have, can have very nice structures, OK? So they're, they're, but, but how they position in space, I'm going to assume they're random. And again, the theory is extended to, uh, into those correlations, but I, I won't do it today. OK? So that's, uh, that's uh, one statistical assumption. And, uh, and then the labels are random. So y um, u's are, you know, plus minus 1 uh, independent random. So I sample p of them and assign those to, to the manifolds. And then, uh, of course, the thermodynamic limit. We cannot uh, live without it. So the thermodynamic limit, not surprisingly, is going to be p and n is infinite, going to infinity, 
but p over n alpha equals to p over n is fixed, or the one fixed. And, but, but here I have to say more, because I have most, more parameters. So I have to say d is finite, so it's a low-dimensional manifold. d relative to n are finite, so d is finite. Uh, and, and similarly, the, uh, you know, the, the, the shape m are fixed. So, you know, the shapes are fixed. As n goes to infinity, I add more of them. If, or, or, or at p goes to infinity, I, may, I add more of them, but the geometry are fixed. So I fix geometries, and if I want to in, in, increase p, I just add more of these randomly positioned and orientation or oriented. Or if the geometry is not fixed, then I have some statistical generation uh, ensemble of, of, of this. All right. So this is the problem, OK? So, uh, so you, you see, this is a linear classification problem, but not it's still on points. You classify points, but points, but there is a strong correlation between the labels of different points. Good, but, but I, I'm sure you are expert on Gardner theory and capacity of perceptron. Yeah, but this, this has been covered. Okay, good. So, so basically, the goal is to extend the classical theory of, uh, uh, of linear classification of points to linear classification of manifolds. But before doing the theory, uh, discussing the theory, we can discuss bounds. And I think this is kind of illuminating. Okay? Yes? When P is louder than N, yeah. Well, then they're approximate. Well, as I said, this, are, this is the assumption. It's not really orthogonal. I can always do this. Yeah, it's, yeah, you're right. It's not. OK, first of all, p is not going to be larger than n, typically. But p is going to be, but p times d is going to be larger than n. OK, so there are many of them. So you're right. So this is why, this is the, this is the assumption. That's, the old Gaussians. All right. So, so let's talk about uh, about bounds, which we can uh, we can um, do it in our head. So uh, remember, I introduced this R parameter. So let's say what happens when R goes to zero. So this will be bound number one. R goes to zero. Well, if R goes to zero, what do I have? I just point randomly. Point random points, right? P points, random, is the random labels. This is perceptron problem, right? Or SVM problem, a linear SVM. So, so we know that alpha, so I'll denote, uh, OK, let me see here. This is the, I'll denote by alpha m the max alpha under these conditions such that uh, there is a, a perfect uh, 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 classification, linear classification, uh, with probability with probability with, with probability just goes to goes to one in the thermodynamic limit. So, but probability I mean averaging over the labels. So, for given, so some in in, in finite n, some choice of labels will have a solution. Other choices will not have a solution. But in large n, there is a very sharp phase transition. OK? Below, for alpha less than alpha m, almost all of choice of labels will have w that will separate them. For alpha bigger than alpha m, the, the probability is, is exponentially small in n. So, so there is a, 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 a phase transition. This is the same as uh, as in in the, in the in the perceptron case. So in that case, uh, you know uh, the the the, the, um, the capacity is two in in, in these limits. So this is alpha. So the probability is one up to two, and it falls to zero beyond above two. Okay. So this is why R, R goes to zero. Um, so alpha m is just Gardner, which is two. Okay. And if you want, uh, this, is, this is for zero, for this zero margin. If you insist on a margin, then you can write down, instead of that, that alpha m of kappa uh, is, is, is Gardner, alpha zero, what I call alpha zero of kappa, which is, uh, which, which is a function. 
So what is the margin if I plot here the maximum margin that I can achieve with points as a function of alpha? So at the, at the capacity limit, the margin will be zero. The smaller the alpha is, the larger the margin that you get. So it kind of diverges uh, close to zero. So this is kappa of alpha or alpha of kappa. So this is the famous alpha zero of kappa or kappa, uh, alpha zero of kappa. This is this function, the Gardner function. So this is what is the maximal margin for a given alpha or for a given margin, what is the maximal alpha that you can achieve this margin, and it will be the same. Okay? Questions here? Everything is fine. Okay. So this is one limit. Now, what about the other limit? R goes to infinity. Well, this is trickier because R goes to infinity basically means that we have unextended manifold. So, so the manifold is simply, each manifold is a subspace, a d-dimensional subspace. So we're just separating subspaces, hyperplanes. So the question, how many d-dimensional hyperplanes you can separate by, by a hyperplane uh, if, if those hyperplanes are, are randomly oriented? So you can do the following argument. So you can say the following. The, the, basically, if if a hyperplane intersect W, then we are done, right? So, so if for given W, it's, W has to be such that no hyperplane intersect it, no matter where, right? Because R, R is infinite, right? So then it's clear that W has to be orthogonal to all the U's, because otherwise there would be some direction which will intersect it with the, with the hyperplane. So basically it means that the effective degrees of freedom is the number of dimensions which, are, which remain after being, after being orthogonal to all this. So n effective is going to be n minus p times d, because this is the number of u's that I have. So, and, and w has to be orthogonal to all of them, otherwise the, it will not be separating. But then, after that, we, we, got, we, get, we get back to Gardner, because once w is, uh, uh, in, uh, is, is orthogonal to all, to project out all the U's, then what remains is the X zero, which are points, points projected in the null space. So then you, you can say P max, P max in this case is an effective, uh, so uh, P an effective times alpha, basically alpha zero of kappa, which is again Gardner, but in, in uh, because what remains is the, is the points, but, but n effective itself is n minus p d times alpha zero of kappa. So what you get is alpha, uh, so, so what you get is that alpha m of kappa, in this case, you, you know, you divide by n, um, the algebra, I can just look here. Okay, good. Alpha zero of kappa divided by one plus d times alpha zero of kappa. You just solve this, you divide by n, this is p and this is p, so you get alpha here, and you solve this equation. So this is, this is for the hyperplanes. So r goes to infinity. And now you can see that if for d small, well, d equals to 1, then it's, you know, alpha 0 over uh, 1 plus alpha 0 of kappa. It's, you know, for kappa equal to 0, it would be 2, two thirds. If you have lines, infinite lines, how do you, can you separate them? Well, if the number of lines is 2 thirds of n, it's fine. But for d large, this is problematic. This will be like 1 over d for d large. And we are going to be very much interested in large D. A N is infinite here, but, but still D can be 10 or 20 or 50, so that's large. Okay, so, so, uh, so this is 1 over D, so this is, this is small. So we start from 2 here for cup equal to 0, and we end up in 1 over D when R goes to infinity. So basically, we can conclude from this that alpha M, let's say cup equal to 0, is between 2 and uh, 1 over d. This is r equal to 0. 
and this is uh, and this is so actually, so more precisely it will be two over uh, you know one plus two d. So it will be one it will be one plus d plus one half for any d. So this is the bound. This is r goes to zero and r goes to infinity. Right. So these are the two extremes. Right. Okay. There is another limit. Okay, so that's, that's, I think, if now no questions, I can go on. Another extreme, or, or not ex yeah, another extreme is point cloud, but random. Random point cloud, I mean, each manifold has n points per manifold. Okay, but they're randomly randomly selected. Can you mean alpha inverse? Can you say it again? I think two is the maximum alpha inverse. Okay, so let's so so what happens here? We have to be careful. So there are m points per manifold, but two two is the maximum anyway. Yeah, it's written for the inequality. No, two two always is the, I mean two is the maximum. Whatever we cannot we cannot be this. This will be points, but this is now. It's not going to be two. But in the inequality, it's in the lower side. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, sorry. Absolutely right. This is less, and this is this is big. Sorry. Thank you very much. Alpha is less than two and bigger than this. Thank you. Good. So, but now we have random. Point clouds, but th this is this example is good for for uh, for kind of a, a baseline. You have points, and you say, well, maybe they are structured, the manifold, and so on. But maybe not. Maybe just random. So suppose I have a collection of images, you know, corresponding to a cat and to a dog and to a house and so on and so forth. But then, who said that they're really correlated? So let's let's do the experiment. Let's reshuffle. Let's just, uh, you know, randomly s give the labels, you know, this is plus one, this is minus one, just randomly shuffle these points and see if, the, if, if there is a structure remains. So this is this, uh, this is the shuffled experiment. Well, then it's, it's also clear what's, what's happening because, because there is no structure, then basically what you have, you have MP points all together, M times P, and they don't have any structure, and the labels is basically random on them, so it's a game gardener. So basically what you get is alpha is going to be 2 over m, right? Because it's p over n, so it's 2 over m. It's point. So, so, so uh, we can summarize here another limit, which is 2 over m. m this, is, this makes sense for, for point cloud. Otherwise, m may be infinite, so it doesn't make sense. But for point cloud, it's 2 over m, if it's, if it's random. So we have this bound. <laughs> Sorry, but in this case, we still have the constraint that all clouds have the have uniform labels. No, but they're random. So uh, you know, so take random points, and 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 half of them will be plus one, half of them minus one. Okay, it happened to be a collection of points that have plus ones. Right? It's, it it doesn't it doesn't mean anything if there is no structure. <clears throat> All right, so, so these are bounds, and this is very good, uh, not only theoretically to, uh, for sanity check, but also in practice when you want to test it, you, you, you have bounds, simple bounds to compare to. Are, are, are the are, are alpha that I, does alpha order one, or this is more like one over D, or more like two over M if I point cloud, and so on. Okay. So now I want to do some math. Where is this? And I'm not going to, to solve the problem on the blackboard. It's, it's too, too, too technical to make the solution, but I give you the kind of the, the essence of that. Good. So, so first of all, what I didn't say, but I should say, is that uh, that I, I need to know. I, I already normalized the use. I, I raised here, but 
All of them are approximately unit vectors, the use and the excess, and the x zeros, I'm sorry, uh, the, the Gaussians with one over n variances. Uh, now, what is W? W, uh, uh, I normalize the, the relevant normalization for W, one can show in this thermodynamic limit, uh, is to choose W uh, to have norm n. But, but, of course, you can define whatever W you want. If you scale W, you, you of course, uh, have to scale kappa. Uh, but but, but the, the thermodynamic limit uh, applies also in points where W is normalized to n in this way. X is normalized to 1. The norm of Xs are 1. Not exactly 1, but the norm of X, X0 and U are 1. The norm of W is uh, squared is n. And kappa is order 1. Okay. This already. This is because the task is hard. Even, you know, you need a big W to separate. That turns out to be the relevant normalization in, in thermodynamic limit, even for points. So then, uh, what? How, how do we solve this problem? We, we write down the volume, like uh, uh, Garner-like calculations. What we say, we 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 compute the space the volume in, in W, D and W. We put a delta function on the normalization of W. And then we put the constraint. The W has to, has to obey all these constraints. So it's par, product on mu goes from 1 to n of, uh, of theta, a step function, which is uh, y mu w dot x mu for all s uh, minus kappa. So this is product of mu and, 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 and of all s. For each manifold, s may be infinite. So infinite number, potential infinite number of constraints. So that problem seems to be untractable. Or, or you have to work hard or maybe ask Lenka how to do, if, if you really want to really explicitly work with, uh, with a continuum or infinite number of constraints, OK? But it turns out that this is uh, not, not such a big problem. And the reason is that if, if all of the points on the manifold have to obey this constraint, then, it, then, then obviously I can write it down by saying the minimal point, the worst point, has to obey this constraint. So I'm going to write this as, <coughs> forget about S here, but write instead of this, write H min. H min of, of manifold mu, which is a function of W, of course, minus, minus kappa. And H min of manifold mu is simply defined by minimum minimizing over S, over the points of the points in the manifold of w of y mu w dot x mu of s. I mean, I, I'll, I'll use notation. You can also unpack this and write this as, uh, as the following. So what is y mu w dot x mu of s? x mu has x0 <coughs> for all s. So I can write this as. Uh, min of uh, v0, which I'll define in a moment, plus mu, plus v mu dot, uh, dot, uh, dot y. Uh, no, I'm sorry, minimum dot s. Minimum over s. I can write this inequality in d or d plus 1 dimension. The projection of W on the manifold, on the center of manifold mu, so this is V0 mu, is the projection of W on the center. And V are the projection of W on each one of the U's. So V I mu, v I mu is W Y mu times W dot Y I. Yeah, I'm sorry, U I. And S is the d-dimension. So, so now I have to do the minimum given W. Okay, so W is given. 
I can compute its projections on the axis, on the d plus 1 basis of the manifold. These are the v's. And then each point on the manifold is a d-dimensional coordinate s. And I have to minimize this d-dimensional coordinate. So I reduce the problem, this part, into a d-dimensional minimization. Okay, got rid of the n-dimension. Okay? So then I can, then I, then, then I have to solve this problem. Okay? So I, product of all manifolds, for given w, compute the minimum, the, the, the worst h that you can get, and you, you, you ask that the worst h is bigger than kappa. Okay. OK, so uh, now you, you can do uh, several things, uh, but, but uh, probably the simplest one, it depends on your taste, and is to do, to do a replica. Uh, in, in, you know, you add, you replicate W, so you have W alpha and delta, w, and delta W alpha here and alpha here, because it depends on W. And you do the, uh, you do the averaging over the statistic that I mentioned, the U's and the V's and the labels, and OK, and, and, and by now, all of them, Lenka, are experts on doing that, right? Replica, and n goes to 0, and all this stuff, right? OK, so, expert. Okay, so, so you, you do this. Uh, you take the n goes to 0 limit, uh, and then you get uh, an expression of the volume. Uh, but, but we want to make our life easy, because we want to ask what is, we want to be, what, to, what is the maximal kappa for a given alpha? Or, uh, sorry, this is mu goes to 1 to p. Or, or, or what is the or what is the maximum p for a given kappa? So in that case, uh, the, the volume shrinks to zero, right? So we are looking at at the point where there is almost no solution. This is why we want to uh, we want to compute the, the capacity either for kappa equal to zero or for or some finite kappa. Okay. So we t we do the replica and then ask, okay, so we have a solution for the volume. Now at what point the volume goes to zero? This will give us relation between kappa and p, or between, yeah, what, that's what we want. OK, so when you do this, I'll just give you the result, and I'll give you some interpretation of the result. So uh, it turns out that the inverse of this function, alpha 1 over alpha m, m is for manifold of kappa, is, is going to be the following, is going to be an average over some function of a, a t plus 1 Gaussian vector, uh, where t is, uh, is d, d plus 1. I sometimes will write it as t0 times t. This is d dimension. This is another dimension of t, the t0. And this is d plus 1 Gaussian with the with, uh, with uh, with variance, uh, you know, one over n. So so it is just uh, Gaussian vector, and you you have to have an f of t. So for each t, for each sample of this Gaussian d plus one Gaussian vector, you have to compute f of t, and f of t is going to be uh, the mean over t minus v squared. So you look at the, you, you find the vector v, another d plus 1 dimension, which is the, the nearest to t, right? So, so you, you, you minimize respect to v, again, d plus 1 dimension, such that uh, the mean of uh, s, as we discussed it, uh, or the mean of a, of a d plus 1 vector s of v dot s is bigger than, is bigger than kappa. Uh, so you have to find 
the closest vector d plus one dimension v to t, to this random vector t, such that the, the, the vector, the point on the, the, the worst point on the manifold course relative to v is bigger than kappa. That's the optimization problem. So it's not trivial, but we reduced the whole problem into a d or d plus one dimensional problem. Okay, we forgot about, we got rid of n. Okay. So that's the problem I have to solve, okay? So uh, for, for some nice manifold like, like spheres or, or, or ellipsoid, we can do the analytics. And uh, I'll show an example of an analytical example uh, of a solution for that, doing the whole thing analytically. Uh, but, but in general, for a general manifold, you have, to do, you have to run this algorithm. Okay. But I want to give you some interpretation of, uh, of, this, of this story here, what, what it is. So let's first talk about how, how you solve this, or one way to solve it, is to use a, a Kuntaker framework. And I, I, I think they, they know, right? Kuntaker, no? Kuntaker theory for max margin, you, you, with all, after two weeks? I, I, uh, I used it in my lecture. You did it. OK, so Nati did it, right? OK, so anyway, so how you solve it? So I just, I just quote, it's a famous result of how you, how you solve this type of problems, convex optimization problems, quadratic uh, objective function with, uh, with the linear constraints, OK? Basically like Lagrange multiply problem. So what you do is you, uh, you minimize, so you can, you can characterize the solution in this way. You can write down, you take a derivative with respect to V with a Lagrange multiplier on this. So basically what you get is V equals to T plus lambda times a derivative here with respect to V is, is S. So you, 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 I write this S twiddle. Uh, so so you, you, you minimize this with the Lagrange multiplier lambda on, on this inequality. But then, of course, you have to uh, make sure that, uh, that they, are, they satisfy the, the different constraints. And the different uh, constraints is that, first of all, this S has to be the mean. So, so this S, S twill, uh, has to be the arg mean of, uh, of V dot S. Right, that's that's the constraint. Uh, uh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. That uh, I'm sorry. S is the arg mean. That's the definition of S, right? And then it has to obey the constraint. So basically, the constraint is that um, that v. So this is the definition of S. So v uh, dot s twiddle uh, uh, is bigger than kappa. And 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 turns out lambda has to be uh, 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 bigger than 0 or equal to 0. And essentially, you can write uh, more than that, that lambda times v dot s twiddle minus kappa is 0, which means, which means that if the inequality constraint is strictly obeyed as an inequality, so this is bigger than zero, then lambda is zero. And if this is zero, if you are really on the margin, then lambda can be positive. Okay? So, uh, and, and basically, this set, of, this set of equations, one conditions, one, two, three, four, five, are the Kuntaker conditions. If you find a solution to them, you solve this problem. That's, that's a theorem. OK. Um, so uh, so, so this, this, this uh, gives you, as the output, what it gives you is for each t, it gives you s of t, this d plus 1 dimension vector t. Uh, it gives you the, 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 the coefficient lambda as a function of t. And it gives you v as a function of t. Okay, and then and then you and then you keep doing it, sampling t and and, and average out. So this is one way to solve it to use a, 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 a package that solves the Kuntaker conditions for each t. You have this v lambda and so on, and 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 you have this the value here. This t minus v is simply lambda square s square, right? And and you you sample over t. 
Okay. So this is, this is the Kuntaker, but, but the Kuntaker gives you also, I think, a nice interpretation of what's going on. And I want to remind you, and again, I don't know, did you learn about support vectors? Did, did you hear about support vectors for max margin? I, I didn't. Okay, this was on the list, and I said I need it. Okay, so, so those of you that don't, are not familiar with that, I, you know, it won't help you. Uh, but those of you familiar, I, I, I want to sp spend a few minutes to, to, uh, to remind you about that and to see the connection. So, in general, this is, this is a max margin problem. You have a set of points, you want to find a linear classifier such that uh, it's not only going above zero, but, but you know, it gives you, uh, you, 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 you want to ask what is the maximal margin. You want to find W such that it gives you, not here, but in the original problem, to give you the maximal margin. So remember, we had Y mu, W dot X mu of S uh, bigger than kappa. And now I'm saying I want to find W. Basically, what we are doing is saying we want to find W that maximizes kappa. We are maximizing alpha, but it's basically behind it is the same story. It's a max margin problem. If there is a solution, we are just taking the solution which maximizes kappa. And, uh, and that's known as the, as the max margin uh, 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 framework or, or support vector machines. Basically, you have a set of points. You, you want to ask what is the linear classifier that gives you the, 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 the largest margin. So what is the largest margin is here, you know, you have a set of points. These are plus, let's say these are minus. And, and you, want to, you want a separator, this is kind of n dimension. You want not only to separate the plus from the minus, but you want to find the hyperplane such that the minimal distance, this is the margin the minimal distance is maximized. So you want to orient the plane. So this is W. And you want to orient the plane, given the points, such that the minimal, the, the closest point to the plane is, 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 is distance is, is maximized. So if I, if I orient the plane this way, it is still classified, but this point will be closer. Okay, so this is the max margin problem. Okay, so it turns out that the max margin uh, 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 solution has a nice uh, form. So you can show that the max margin, so if there is a solution, if the points are linearly separable, then there must be a solution. Maybe margin is small, but there must be a solution. So you find the, the, the solution with the maximal margin, and you can write it in terms of a set of support vectors. So y goes from 1 to n of uh, lambda mu what is my notation? Lambda mu, y mu, uh, x mu, x mu, where, where, where the lambdas mu are, are bigger or equal to zero. So you can write, so from 1 to p, so you can write down the solution in terms of a, a linear combination of, of, of the examples, of the training examples. Uh, kind of hebul, if you want, input, output. H however, the, the, it's only a subset of them which are non-zero, because many of the lambdas may be zero. And it turns out that the, the, all, all the points which are interior to the manifold, to, to the hyperplane, okay, so in this case, all these points are, 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 are far away from the margin, they will have lambda equal to zero, but this point may be, and, and maybe if there is a here, another point with the same distance, so they will have lambda not zero, or, or may have lambda not zero. So they are called the support vectors. They are kind of the support of the hyperplane. They constrain the hyperplane very tightly. The other one, they don't care because you can move it a little bit and they, it won't change the story. So only a subset of, this, uh, of, the, of all the training examples are going to have a non-zero coefficient. And this subset are called the support vectors. Okay? So what about the manifold? Let's forget about replica and all. What about the manifolds? Okay, so again, we are basically solving a max margin problem. We are, we are separating, but we ask to separate the manifold with the largest margin. So W will have this form, except that now, of course, I have uh, here, I have sum over mu, but I, I, I'll have, in, in, you know, in principle, sum over lambda mu and S, and again, summing over all S with Y mu, which doesn't depend on S, but then W 
<coughs> I'm sorry, not W, X mu of S. Okay? Infinite number of, 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 of support vectors in principle. No, that's, that's not nice. But it turns out that the problem is, is, is not so hard, is not so, uh, not so uh, hopeless, because <coughs> the, 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 the linear separation is, is a convex problem. Right? So, so if I can separate manifolds, I can separate the convex hull of them. So which, which means that here, instead of, let's say I have zillion points on a manifold, x mu of s, but I can combine all of them to one vector, which is the con convex combination of all these. So I can write this as sum of only summing over mu, from 1 to p, lambda mu, not lambda mu of s, y mu, and then here there will be x, mm, call it x twiddle mu, a, at most one vector per manifold. And this is just a convex, this is lambda mu, this will be x, x twiddle mu is simply sum over s of lambda mu of s times the original x mu of s, you know, divided by the sum over s of lambda mu of s. This is a convex combination of the original point. So this is this point, and this lambda mu here are this summation. Okay. Okay. So it's an algebra that you can do. But that's nice, because now we call this, this is support vectors. We call this anchor points. Uh, they, they are like support vectors, but now they represent the entire manifold. A manifold that has non-zero lambda it means that the manifold is sitting next to the hyperplane. So, you know, you have here a manifold, and you may hear a manifold. In this case, this manifold has these anchor points here, right? This is interior, but there may be another manifold here with an anchor point, maybe the same distance. So this will be the anchor point. So that's nice. Every manifold is represented by one vector, which is kind of the worst vector with respect to, to hyperplane, the closest to the hyperplane, anchor points, okay? Now, you see, anchor points are, are, are important because we'll talk about them, because as we'll see, they, 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 they define the geometry. Yes, what was the, what was the comment? Yeah. A question? Yeah. manifold might have all lambda zero. May have all what? All lambda. And now a manifold has only one lambda. And of course, lambda is zero means that all the lambdas are zero. Right. Here, this manifold will have zero lambda. So it won't have an anchor point. That what? It won't have an anchor point. It won't have an anchor point. We, for, 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 for theoretical convenience, we, we define an anchor point, in any case, the, the, the closest point to the, to the hyperplane. But in principle, you can also say that's zero. But it's, it's simpler to just. But in terms of W, what enters are only the, the manifolds that have uh, anchor points which are the closest, which are at the margin, okay? But I'll define anchor point anyway, just, just to, to make life easier. But, the, but this vector here will not, will not be here, will not be in this sum. That they are what? Convex. No. So the point is, so this is the important point. The point is that the, the manifold themselves may not be convex. You know, a set of fi finite set of points, a banana, or w whatever, right? But, but the point is, if there is a W that separates the manifolds, if and only if, it separates also the convex holes of the manifolds. So you can assume, basically, that the manifolds are convex. But, but this point Uh, absolutely, absolutely correct. The anchor points may not be. So here is an example. I have a, you know, I have a manifold. Oh, no, that's not a good example. So, um, um, okay, I have um, maybe something like that. Uh, the, the, I have two. I potentially two. Here, here is an example. I have potentially two points here. And the convex hull, the, 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 the actually the anchor point will be this, right? 
it will be it will be convex sum of points on the manifold. So it will sit on the convex hull of the manifold of, of the manifold. This is why linear classification of manifolds, although rich and complex and very interesting and exciting, but it is simpler in terms of the geometry because you can ask what happens if I have holes and I have edges and so on. Well, you, you fill in you fill them because the, the same po linear classification is a convex problem and therefore if there is W, it's clear. If there is W to separate, then W will separate the, you know, any separation, any linear separation of Ws will also linear separate, linearly separate the convex hull of those. Sorry, but the total uh, fraction of super vector will still be dependent on the d dimension of the manifold, right? So you're saying that there is at most one super vector per manifold? There is one. There is at most one anchor point per manifold, but many of them may be zero. But the, but the total number of anchor points at the given problem will depend on D or not? No, no, no. That, that's, a, that's, a complex, that's a complex story. Even for points, it's not easy to calculate. You can do with Garner. Yeah, what I'm saying is that then it's, uh, is it exactly as for points or uh, the total fraction of the super vector? The theory, tell, the, the theory predicts what is the total fraction there is, you know, lambda mu average square. The theory will predict because I'll, I'll, you, well, if I have an expression for lambda, and you can see what, what, what it is. But, but, but this is under the statistical assumptions. It's not a general. D, but it still depends on D, the total number. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah, of course, yeah. All right. So, so I want to connect these anchor points to to this theory, and you can see what 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 really I think going on. So let's look at this equation. What this equation means? This equation, I claim, is the following, has the following interpretation. We, we have this W, and now we pick one, one manifold, and we focus on this manifold. Okay? So then we look at the, what we do. We, we, want, we look at the projection of, I mean, this manifold it only cares about the projection of W on each subspace. So we look at the projection of W on this manifold, on manifold number one, let's say, okay? Well, so then W, I, I defined V, you remember V0 and, and V perpendicular, these are basically the projection of W on the center plus the use of manifold one, let's say. This is this vector V. It's a, it's a d dimensional representation of W in a given manifold, has d plus one coordinates, okay? This is the contribution, so now I'm, I'm looking here, but I'm, I'm projecting it on the, d, d, uh, on the d plus one dimension of manifold one. So manifold one may, may contribute if lambda, if this manifold has an anchor point which is not zero, it will contribute a point, and the point will be precisely this. Lambda will be, will be, the, will be the, the, uh, the, the, the support anchor coefficient. And S twiddle, if it is an anchor point, it must be the closest to the margin, so it is the smallest V dot S. Right? And, and, and again, it has to obey this. It has to be bigger than, than, than kappa. And, and uh, as, in, as in usual uh, support vector machine, it has to be this. So if it is bigger than the lambda is zero, if it is on the margin, lambda can be non zero. So this is basically a description V and lambda S, okay? This, this story is basically the, 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 the story of, of the max margin, or Kuntaker in max margin. And what is T? Okay, the T is if I project this W on one manifold, I have the contribution of lambda from this manifold, which is this contribution. But I have all the other contribution. Mu goes from 2 to P. They also contribute, right? The, so you have w dot x zero one will have you know x two dot x zero one and all these terms. Okay, so this is random, so to speak, Gaussian noise. So from the perspective of manifold one, this is the contribution, the signal. This is the contribution of manifold one on the w. And this is the noise. It's coming from the interference of all the other, all the other manifolds to W. Okay. Right? So for, from, the, from the egoistic project, a, a perspective of a given manifold, V, W, V is the contribution of its own anchor points plus 
the random contribution from all the rest, Gaussian. Okay? And then once you, you know this, then you say, okay, this is just the Kuntakel, the Kuntakel theory for max margin, you know, textbook. This is the way you solve it, okay? So the only thing is that you have this T, random, random. So, so you, what does it mean to sample T? So, so anyway, so, 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 so if, when you do this, what you find is the support vector for this configuration. And, and again, you can average over T and you get your answer. What is the fraction of support vectors which are non-zero? You get V of T, which is the, which is given the environment, what is the projection, you know, what is the projection of W on my, on my, uh, on my uh, subspace? It has to be T plus lambda S. So you get V of T, you get lambda of T, you get S of T, and, and, and that's basically the story. All right. So now, I don't know how much time I have. Okay. Oh. Okay. So, so, okay. So now, uh, let. Okay, five minutes is good. So, so maybe. Okay. So let me. Let me show you. Um, how? So, so let me just give you a, an equation for the case if you solve this for spheres, d-dimensional spheres, with some radius r. So for spheres, we get that alpha m minus 1 is a function, of course, of r and d. And it has uh, integral uh, d I'm sorry, d dimensional. So remember, this t is d, d plus 1 dimensional Gaussian. In the spheres, uh, it, it, the, 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 okay, so, so this, this t is t0 times t. This is the projection of, of this random vector on x0, and this is the projection on the d-dimensional subspace. So uh, it turns out in Gaussian, only the magnitude of t matters, so it is absolute value. And this is the chi distribution of d-dimensional Gaussian of its, of its magnitude. And, and then for each t, we have a Gaussian d, capital D is the Gaussian measure on, uh, on, on t0 from kappa minus t r minus 1. This goes up to kappa plus t times r. And here you have a minus t0 plus tr minus plus kappa squared divided by 1 plus r squared. It's one integral. And then there's another integral from 0 to infinity of dt of chi distribution of t. And then there is here from minus infinity to kappa <coughs> minus t times r minus 1. Again, Gaussian measure on T0. And then here the coefficient is T0 minus kappa <coughs> square plus T0. Okay. So, OK, with the expression, you can compute it and, and, and play with it. The, the, the important, the, I just want to add important point about why do you have these two integrals? What is the moral measure? And the, the reason is for the, for the following. In the case of uh, support vectors, you have either, either you have Either you have points, uh, let's say kappa equal to zero. So either you have points on, on, the, on, the, on the hyperplane, then there are support vectors, or they are interior, then they don't contribute. So there are two possibilities. Either lambda is, OK, but here it is more, here it is more, more interesting. Suppose I have spheres, OK? So I have, I have possibility that I have, a, you know, these are interior spheres that don't contribute. But these are touching spheres. So this is one possibility, that, that the spheres touch, at one point, the hyperplane. But if it is a hyperplane, 
I can have also that this, the spheres are residing inside, fully inside the margin. Okay? They're also zero, zero distance, okay? but they're fully embedded in the margin. And you can imagine if you have arbitrary shape, you have, you have a, a hierarchy of possible geometries of how the manifolds are situated respect to the, to the separating plane. They can be a touching, they can be an edge, they can be a face, and et cetera, et cetera. But for spheres, because of the convexity and smoothness, uh, you know, they, they, these are the only two possibilities, either touching or fully embedded. This is the contribution to the inverse capacity from the touching, and this is the contribution from fully embedded. I think it's fine. Anyway. <laughs> so, so uh, and, and then for more complicated, so, for, for ellipsoid, it also the two possibilities because of the convexity and smoothness. It's smooth convex will always have this kind of two contributions. But for, for convex but non-smooth, but non when you have edges and sharp edges and so on, there are many, many possibilities. But in principle, you can write down, the, the, it will break down to a series of terms like that. Okay, let's stop here. And uh, I, tomorrow I'm talking. Oh, man, oh. Uh, next next lecture, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how this generates geometry on manifolds, and then I'll, I'll go back to the to the actual data.